Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to Mondays at Murdoch. My name is Meg, and I look after partnership for Murdoch University, Dubai. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we are very pleased to have you with us. And we also, I would like to uh, welcome and introduce Stuart Harrison, the CEO of Emerald Services. Thank you so much, Stuart, for joining us today. Um, and we have a very interesting topic uh, today that he's going to talk about, which is uh, about, uh, you know, how to have your career passion. So that's something that uh, we all are looking forward to. A very quick introduction about Stuart. He has about 25 years of experience in technical operations, engineering, and serious business roles. Stuart has played an instrumental role in delivery of fast facilities management and engineering services across a diverse range of projects and sectors. Um, also critical environments such as um, airports, hospitals, and sensitive government sites. In his role uh, uh, as a CEO of Emerald, he works with semi-government organizations and government authorities, as well as private developers, property management, and asset owners. He oversees the execution of contracts that cover full range of facilities management services, such as engineering, MEP, HVAC, uh, energy performance management, and soft services, including housekeeping. Uh, Stuart started this in 2017, and he implemented the first energy performance contract, EPC, which was a pilot project in the UAE. Uh, he also developed the first NIC EIC accredited electrical training course in, in the UAE. He has also been recognized as a leader amongst his peers, receiving a lot of awards and his contributions to the facilities management sector. And he's often called upon as an expert speaker in, in, in conferences, universities and industry events. Stuart is also a member of the Institute of Engineering and Technology, MIET, and Chartered Management Institute. Uh, he holds a Master's of Science in Management and is also NIBOSH certified. So that's uh, an impressive and um, extraordinary profile. Uh, and we have lots to learn from him today. So really look forward to that. Uh, dear participants, uh, welcome once again. and. Um, Please note that the videos and mics for you are not enabled. Uh, however, there is a chat as well as a Q&A box down uh, below your screen and you are welcome to post your comments, feedback and questions towards the end of the session. We'll quickly go through uh, and uh, Stuart would be happy to answer a few of them. Uh, without further ado, I would now like to again welcome and request uh, Stuart to please take over and begin the session. Thank you, thanks for that introduction. And apologies for the non-engineers. Um, it, it, it's, it's not a very impressive thank you, but I, I expect for non-engineers it wasn't, wasn't terribly exciting. Um, I also have to apologize, I have a, I have a cold. Um, my throat's sore and my nose is blocked, uh, but I'm gonna talk about tenacity. So it wouldn't have set a very good example if I'd have uh, not presented because I have a cold. So, um, so what I'm going to talk about today is finding your career passion. Um, and that's, I sometimes struggle with these terms, passion uh, and, and, and whatever it is that you love and things like that. And, and usually when I start these conversations, I talk about, well, I ask a question and I say, look, if you won $50 million on the lottery tomorrow, would you still take the same path, the same career path? Now, normally that stops people in their tracks. Um, and they might think differently about it. So it's all well and good to say a passion, the things that you're interested in, um, and, I'll, and I'll talk about that a, a little bit more. Um, but sometimes you have to make pragmatic decisions in, in what's realistic, how you can start getting into something. Um, I'm sure if we all had unlimited funds, we might take a different entry into our chosen careers or a, diff a slightly different path. Um, Usually these kinds of speeches are done by movie stars, so I wouldn't put myself certainly in the same class, but I watched one um, a little while ago with Denzel Washington, uh, a graduation speech. Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger is very famous for motivational uh, speeches. Um, Al Pacino does a very good one in the, in the, the movie uh, about football, uh, American football. 
Um, and they generally talk about chasing your dreams like it's a singularity, like it's one photon of light in your future that you're, you know, that, that you have to be drawn towards and you can't, you, you know, you can't turn your view away from that. Um, I took a much more pragmatic view than that. Denzel Washington, if you've not seen the speech, then, then I'd advise you to watch it after, after this or whenever you get time, because it's very good. And I'm not criticizing Denzel, but he talks about not having anything to fall back on. And what he suggests is that if you fall back, if you have anything that you fall back on, it might take away some of the drive and some of the passion um, towards your goals. I tend to slightly disagree with that, and I can use a very very pragmatic example. I've always been quite driven in the things that I do, obviously, because I'm a CEO, you know, that that's probably stands to reason. But I've always been quite uh, passionate about the things that I do in sports, and I always push myself very hard. So um, I'm not a terribly good long distance runner, but I enjoy it a lot, um, perhaps a little bit more when I was younger than I do now, because I'm, I'm nowhere near as fit as I was. But I went running once in the desert a good few years ago, um, and I didn't take a phone. Nobody knew where I was going, um, and I was genuinely on my own, uh, nothing to fall back on at all. Um, Denzel Washington talks about always falling forward, not falling back. Uh, after about 10 kilometers, I wasn't well, something, I, wasn't, I wasn't doing very well that day, um, but I, can't, I just thought, well, I'll keep pushing, I'll keep pushing. And the next thing I remember was, I just remember lying down and thinking, this doesn't feel very comfortable at all. I need to shift position because I don't, this, this, this grit, this, sand on the side of my face doesn't feel very nice and then I thought well, hang on a minute and I realized that I'd, I'd, I'd fainted and, and collapsed in the desert now I had to get up and I had no backup I had no phone I had nothing at all to fall back on and that was a very very long walk back more than 10 kilometers um, didn't know what was wrong with me it just turns out I was, I was exhausted and I had, I had kind of infection and things but but on that particular day I really wished I had something to fall back on and I expect that if you throw, um, you know, if you abandon any kind of reason and you just hurtle towards your dream without any kind of sensible decisions being made other than focused on that one singularity, that you might get to a point where you regret that. Um, and and my, my, my counsel, my advice is probably, you know, watch Denzel's speech, but then maybe listen to mine and maybe try and find somewhere in between because we can't all be CEOs and movie stars. Um, and, and sometimes you need something to fall back on. And as I said, you, you can't just you can't just drop into into you know your chosen place to be in the world. Sometimes you have to work hard, and well, always you have to work hard. But sometimes you have to kind of take a, a more convoluted path to get there. Um, and, and I should caveat this by saying I'm not a career advisor. I've never heard one of these speeches by a career advisor. Um, they're all people that set off on a journey just like me. You know, um, you know like I said, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in kind of some very esteemed company when I do these kinds of things because there are some very famous and influential people um, that do them, but they're just like me. They're just like you. They're people that set off on a journey. They're very inspirational ones. Um, I, I, you know, I, I'm not sure whether I'll hit that point or not, but the people who started out with nothing, just like me, um, and, and then they achieved something. I find that that's inspirational. Um, so you've got to decide what you want. And when I say what do you want, I, I don't necessarily mean the, the exact job that you want, because you know I'm, I'm 48 years old and, and I started work when I was in my teens. Um, I was a teenager and, and I wasn't exactly sure that the job that I did then would still be the job that I do, you know, even with promotions, uh, you know, 30 or 40 or potentially even 50 years later. Um, so what do you want? And again, when I have these conversations, I always bring up four things and I talk about fame, power, money and freedom. Now, usually that you can sum pretty much everything up with those things. So do you want to be incredibly famous? Um, and I've got an example there is Brad Pitt. Uh, do you want to be very, very powerful? Um, you know, I, I guess the two probably often come hand in hand, but is it power that you want? Do you, you know, do you feel like you want to be able to influence your environment? You want to be able to snap your fingers or, or make decisions that, that mean that you can instantly change things around you? Is that what you're looking for? Um, are, are you looking for money? You know, and, and then believe that everything will come after that? Or are you looking for freedom? And the thing that I wanted most out of anything uh, was freedom. I wasn't interested in power. I wasn't interested in, in fame, definitely not. And I wasn't interested, especially with money. Um, you know, I was all about uh, achieving my aims. And there's somebody who's a good example of that. There's a, there's a fighter pilot who's been very focused on what he wants out of life. Um, there's a scientist. 
and there's some people with money. Um, now, the unfortunate reality is that you can't have all of those things. Um, if you're famous, your freedom goes. So I, I watched an interview with Brad Pitt on YouTube and uh, he was talking about anonymity. He doesn't have anonymity. He has fame, certainly. He has power, of course, because if he books a table at a restaurant, you can guarantee he's going to get it. Um, and he definitely has money, but he can't just go out and buy a pint of milk. I can't think of anything worse um, than that. It, it would, um, you know, I don't think I would sleep at night if I literally couldn't leave the house without people recognizing me, taking photos, looking into every aspect of my existence and my life. So, so choose carefully, but fame, uh, power, money, and freedom are pretty much the four things that you can really, you know, at a point where you're deciding on where you're gonna go in life, um, ask yourself what you want. Um, and then, you know, and then combine that with the things that you're interested in. Um, and, and, you know, you can maybe forge a career for yourself. But like I said, um, some of those people in there, you know, Brad Pitt, I, 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 I don't know his life history, but I'm guessing he didn't actually start out dreaming that, you know, one day he would be a world famous actor. At some point, obviously, he did. Denzel Washington talks about that. He worked in his mother's flower shop. Um, because he didn't really have a direction of where he wanted to go. Um, but he, but he, at one point he felt like he wanted to be an actor and then he pursued that and, and you know, there, there he goes, he, he was famous. Um, start with the right perspective. So I guess this is where the, the, the lecture really starts um, for me. And I talk about, um, you know, my, my journey, I guess. Um, there's a picture that I took, um, you know, many years ago and, and that, was, uh, that was where I lived. Um, that was how I started out. Now, I, I chose to go and do a job that was away from home. I couldn't afford to stay in somewhere that was uh, very nice. I had to make sacrifices. So if you look in that picture, you won't see any laptops. There was no phone. Smartphones were, were kind of, I think, maybe just kind of starting to come out, but you know, I couldn't afford one. Um, that picture was actually taken with a cheap camera. When I got it developed, when I eventually went home many, many months later, um, they put it on a CD for me, a, a compact disc. And for some of you young people, you might not even know what one of those is, but um, they, they, and that's how I got it on my, uh, on my computer. Um, I didn't have any money. And if you look, I didn't even have a bed. I had a mattress on the floor. Now, I'm not looking for sympathy then, and, and you know, I certainly don't look for sympathy now, but the point was, was that was what I was willing to do to, to achieve the freedom that I wanted. And that meant that I could go after the job that I wanted because I believed I had a future and, and it would put me in the right place. And I'll talk about that again in a minute. Um, all my friends thought I was nuts, especially you know, months and months later when they saw that picture. And some of my friends still think I'm nuts. They, when, when I talk to them, not, not all of them um, are career minded. And, uh, you know, one particular friend, uh, you know, that, that I've been friends with now for more than 40 years, he thinks I'm insane. He said the amount of energy and time that you put into work and the, the, the amount of stress that you take on, and you've done that now for, for 30 years, um, you know, you're, you're nuts. But I guess it just depends on, are you willing to do what it takes? So, so now, you know, look, I don't have a perfect life, but I have an element of freedom, you know, I can... COVID's probably curbed all of our travel plans and things, but um, it means that I can go on vacation to pretty much where I want um, every year. You know, I, I, I can spend a, a little bit of money on the things that I like to do. I can go and visit my family. I can do things that I want. Um, like I said, I never wanted the fame and the power, but I wanted the freedom. And in order to get that freedom, I needed to, to make a good living. So um, that was what I chose for myself. Um, and I, I've got to be honest with you, the, the first few nights in that room were pretty miserable. Uh, I was a young man, I was away from home, as, as perhaps some of you are, um, and it was pretty miserable. And I, in those days, I couldn't just go on to Skype or, or, or Zoom calls and talk to my family. That, that option wasn't available. I couldn't even phone them. I managed to get a phone card at one point and I could phone home maybe, maybe once a week or once every 10 days or something. But, um, but that was what I was willing to do. Um, there's, there's, I think it's Will Smith does a, does a speech. I don't, I don't watch, I sound like I watch nothing but inspirational speeches. I don't, it's just over the years I've seen quite a few. Will Smith talks about, are you willing to do what it takes to, to get to where you want to go? Um, and I'm not talking about anything untoward or, or anything uh, dishonest or anything like that. Just genuine, honest, um, you know, moves with integrity that get you to where you want to go. And that involves sacrifice unless you're fortunate to be uh, born very rich, and God bless you if you were, but I think most of us weren't, um, you're going to have to work hard and it's not going to come easy. At the end of this presentation, I've got some life lessons that um, some of them are pretty brutal, but you know, I think um, you all deserve uh, honesty. And uh, I, think, I 
thing I've put together and some pretty honest points at the end. Um, now the, the other important thing was that I didn't expect it right there and right then. So I wanted I wanted all the things that are kind of you know I'm still working towards today, but I didn't expect them then. So what I find now is that young people, the, the internet culture, I think, um, has influenced this because you can you can switch on the internet now and you can see you can see anything you want, you know, cars, um, you know, amazing houses, um, all that kind of stuff. And people want it instantly. There's instant gratification. I didn't expect at that point that I was even going to have a laptop or a nice phone or anything. I knew that I'd have to work towards it and it would take me some time to get there. I find that that's lacking. And I think that tenacity and that expectation is the thing that I feel is lacking in a lot of, of people that are maybe starting on that journey today. They, they want instant gratification. If they don't get it very quickly, they lose heart. And again, it's what Denzel, it's what Will Smith, it's what Arnold Schwarzenegger, it's, um, you know, I'm not including myself in that, in that category of, of, of movie stars, but it's what I'm saying as well, tenacity and being willing to make sacrifices and not expect everything today or even tomorrow or even next week, you know, or even next year, maybe, you know, I'm 48 years old. And it's taken me a long, long time to get to a point where, um, you know, I've got some of the things in my life that I wanted 30 years ago. Embrace the journey. So as, I, as I've just said, uh, none of the things that, um, you know, that I talked about, so fame, power, money, freedom, none of those things come easily. Um, it's a journey that you have to, uh, you, you have to, you know, take upon, upon yourself. Um, you will get tired. You will get downhearted. Um, you can't be easy on yourself. You can't quit. Uh, you know, unless you want to stay where you are, if you, you know, look, that's it's obviously just a silly graphic representation, but you know, if evolution had quit um, at that, that third stage, then um, we wouldn't be having this conversation. No, you cannot quit. You cannot be easy on yourself. Um, and again, that's another thing that I think is sometimes lacking is that I, I'm, I'm harder on myself than anybody else will ever be. I, you know, the, the run in the desert was a good example. If anybody was with me, they would have told me to stop way, way before I actually collapsed. Uh, but I'm not, but I always push myself harder than anybody else, and I embrace that journey. I, I, you know, you get to a point where it's almost a little bit masochistic, and you start to enjoy the burn. You know, if any of you gym people out there, uh, you'll understand what I'm talking about, or any any kind of serious uh, anybody that's really into sports, you'll understand what I'm talking about. You start to enjoy um, enduring the hardship, um, you know, and, and enjoying the, the the hard work that you put in. Um, it's an adventure, so I, I feel like I've had several lifetimes. Um, I've been all around the world and, and I've done lots and lots of different things and it's been a huge adventure the whole way through and you know I'm, I'm still on it now and inshallah it'll go on for many years to, to come but you have to embrace that journey. If you just literally, you know like I, I used to do, um, I used to do some boxing and there's been some spectacular um, uh, fight losses in boxing because people saw past the opponent. Um, you know, a recent one you can read about um, with Dillian White. Um, he fought somebody that he believed he was going to win very easily and he, he, he couldn't see the guy for, for what he was. He just saw past him. He saw the fight that was after this one and he lost spectacularly in the ring. Now that can happen to anybody, but if you look past where you are now or where you're going to be tomorrow, you're going to miss that journey. Um, another famous guy, Ozzy Osbourne, um, there was a reality TV show and he, he said something funny like, um, I'm the sort of guy that spends so much time worrying about tomorrow that I don't enjoy what I'm doing today. So even when it's arduous, it's like the sports thing, or it's, it, you know, it's like, like being in the gym. If you're working really, really hard, you know, enjoy it for what it is today. The results will come tomorrow, but enjoy the journey. Don't waste your time focusing on next week or next year or something. Um, I caught myself doing that when I was working away, uh, you know, living in that room. I found that I was just, you know, keep, keeping my head down and concentrating on what I would do when I got home. And I found that I was wishing part of my life away. So don't do that. Enjoy that journey. Uh, the next slide is, I, I, I just put this as an example. Um, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not bragging, but I have, to, I have to kind of give you an example of where my journey kind of brought me through today. Um, that was the room that I started in when I literally had nothing. Um, and ironically, this is the power list. So I never wanted any power and I don't, I don't really claim to have any special power now, but um, every year in, in, the, in the UAE or in, in the GCC region actually, um, they, they do a power list for, for our industry and, and, and you know, there I am in, in number two. Um, 
I'm, I'm absolutely honored that number one is a, is a very well-known local guy, very influential and a very, very nice guy. And I'm absolutely honored to, to kind of share that sort of space with him. In there is, uh, you know, I think the CEO of Serco is in there. There's some CEOs of some other very well-known companies. And you know, I'm absolutely um, honored um, to, 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 to sit in, in that group of people. Um, you know, I, I should obviously mention at this point that it's, it's not about me, it's about the business, it's about where we are as a business and all the 8,000 or 8,500 people that, that stand there with me. Um, but I just wanted to use this as an example of, you know, I started in a, in a room with, with literally the clothes that, uh, you know, I stood up in and, and through a tremendous amount of tenacity and, and grit and determination and, 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 and constantly being there for opportunities, um, you know, I'm the CEO of a company that it's, you know, $130 million revenue company. Uh, very, very proud to be where I am. Very proud of all the 8,000 people that work for us. And it's an absolute privilege to be there. Um, but they didn't give me that for free. I didn't win it in a, in a lottery. Or I didn't win it in a raffle. Um, you know, I didn't wake up one morning and somebody said, hey, do you want to be a CEO of this amazing company? I've, I've been at Emerald for seven years. Um, you know, and every day has been a challenge. And, and I relish that challenge. Some days were better than others. Um, but, you know, I guess that's where I'm at. So I'm not being condescending. I always found it condescending when people said things like, you know, you two can have what I, I've got because maybe, maybe you don't want what I've got. Maybe you want a different path or whatever. I'm just using it as, as an example of, you know, somebody that literally, uh, you, you know, one day woke up with the clothes on his back and, and, and a job, um, you know, 30 years later, um, I'm sitting um, as the CEO of an amazing company and, and I'm, I'm very happy with that journey so far. Um, okay, well, how, how do you get there? Um, so, it, you know, it's not free. Um, as I said, you don't, you don't get those things, uh, you know, by accident even. Um, you know, may, maybe you'll be one of them very fortunate one in a million people or one in several million people that win a lottery or something crazy happens or you have an amazing stroke of luck that propels you very quickly into, into stardom. Um, there are very, very few of those people around and you, you all know who they are. Um, you know, they, they've worked equally as hard, but they've just been very, very fortunate along the way. Um, so I, I think that the, the, I read something somewhere, it said that intelligence is the ability to anticipate the future and, and see what's coming. Uh, and I think that's probably true. Um, one of the things that I've always tried to do is position myself. I, I don't think I've been lucky by any stretch. In, in fact, in many cases, I've been unlucky. But I've been fortunate and there's a difference. So what I did was I created um, a gap for myself. So a good example was I, I took a course um, that I knew nobody else. When I, some years ago when I worked for a smaller company, um, there was about 200 people and, and I knew that nobody else in the company had got this particular qualification and this particular skill. And I thought that in the future that skill might come in very handy because I could see that there was an opportunity for the company to progress into that space. So I got the qualification and, uh, you know, about a year later when the company was moving into that space, I went and saw my boss and said, hey, can I have this opportunity? I want a promotion. I want to be a manager. I want to lead this, this unit. And he said, well, wh why, why should I give it to you? And I said, because I'm the only one in the company that has this qualification. And over the last year, I've been practicing these skills and it was a technical skill, so I won't bore you with it, but um, it meant that I was in the perfect position to take advantage of that opportunity. So it was fortune, it, it wasn't luck because I planned it, it was a pre-planned thing, I, I, you know. Equally, I mean, I also did years and years ago, I did a data course that turned out to be absolutely useless for me. But I think in the last 30 years, I don't think there's been a year where I haven't done at least one type of course, whether that was a postgraduate course, whether it was a NEBOSH that was mentioned earlier, you know, a master's degree, or whether it was a, uh, you know, a city and guilds type qualification or, or something like that. You know, I've always done something and I've always positioned myself, um, uh, you know, so that when opportunity does come along, whether it's in the company that I'm in or whether it's in the, the you know, a future company or a future, um, you know, if you just trade or, or, or market space or, or, or whatever, um, I've always positioned myself that I was able to take that opportunity. So, for example, if I'm not a salesman by any stretch, um, but if I wanted to move into sales, I would then go and look for some qualification. I would look to get some experience when a sales opportunity came up and I was sitting in the seat with the people making the decision. I would definitely be sure that, you know, that, that, that they've seen me. Um, and they've seen what I've done. My, my son's 17 years old um, and he's hoping to get a, a, a technical job. 
and I told him um, in the summer, he did this, in, in the summer, come and do some work experience with us, you won't get paid for it. I, you know, we, we, I wasn't going to pay him for it. And it was up to him. I said, you don't have to. Um, but the, there's an opportunity there, and he did. And what that means is then when he sits in front of somebody and they say, okay, why are you different to the next guy? He can say, well, I work for this great company called Emble, and I'm, you know, I did a work experience there, and they taught me some things, and then he can explain what he was taught. And he puts himself in that position where he's a sensible choice for somebody. Um, so it doesn't always work out. You know, you, you don't always win the lottery, but if you don't buy a ticket, then you've got no chance. So if you don't position yourself um, you know, I, I don't believe that anything comes for free. I really don't. Nothing's, nothing's ever come to me for free. Uh, I've had to work for it. And some people um, have occasionally said to me, you're lucky. You know, and sometimes I don't respond to that. But when I do, I'm like, hey, hang on a minute. How, how am I lucky? You know, look at where I started off. You know, I've lived in places that most people didn't want to go to. I've lived in environments and, 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 and you know, situations that other people weren't willing to take. Uh, and that paid off, that was fortune, that was planning and fortune, it wasn't luck. Um, so I'm not talking about any specific job roles here. I mean, I could bore you to death with, with technical roles. Um, I could talk about business roles and, and you know, in, in another lecture, maybe with a different title, I might do that. But this is just about what do you want out of life um, and, and how can you go about doing that? So decide what you want. Like I said, remember those four things, fame, power, money and freedom, decide what you want. Um, and then start to plan um, and think about how you're going to get there and what kind of things can you do so that when people are making decisions about your future, how have you persuaded them to give you an opportunity or, or give you a break? Um, there you go. Uh, try to be open to every opportunity. That's probably the best advice that I can possibly give you. And then the other thing is as well is you, you might have to take a backdoor route to, to where you want to be. Um, so I can't think of an obvious example, but if you're thinking of a very specific job, you might not be able to step into that job. So you might have to go in, you know, a slightly different route, maybe get some experience and then move into it. And that isn't wasted time. Um, you know, I, I, I was talking to some people in our business the other day about the amount of emphasis that Emerald puts on people for financial responsibility. It's the, it's the, it's a company, um, uh, you know, that, that I've worked for out of everybody else that puts so much um, emphasis on that. I used to work for another big construction company that you will have heard of, um, it was Malfa Beatty. They, they didn't put as much um, financial responsibility onto their technical people that Emerald does. So as well as being a technical person, you have to manage your own P&L and you have to understand how to put your budgets together and how to account for them and how to do accruals and all the kind of stuff that, um, you know, accountancy, um, you certainly wouldn't learn in an engineering class. Um, but what that means is, and what I was saying was, when people, you know, look for the next career move from Emerald, they're going to be very, very well equipped to go into senior business roles because they sit there and they say, hey, look, I know all about health and safety. I'm Bosch qualified. I know all about my technical skill because I've got all the qualifications and the experience. Um, I understand the difference between a P&L and a balance sheet. I know how to manage my own budgets. I know how to work out estimating and, and uh, things like that. So they've got a great advantage there. It's one of the things I think Emerald gives you that a lot of companies don't. It is it's personal responsibility for your, your particular area of business. Okay, you get out what you put in. Um, again, for you gym bunnies or you sports people, um, you know, whatever kind of sport it is, if you don't put the effort in, whether that's a martial art, whether that's sword fencing, whether that's running or whatever it is, sports are a great example of getting out what you put in. If you're not fit enough, you, you, will, you, you won't win, simple as that. I used to race motocross. Um, that often came down to who was the fittest guy in the last few laps because it's very hard to hold on to a motocross bike when, you, when you've been racing for half an hour. Um, and you, you know, you're over very rough ground and jumps and things. Boxing, again, if you're not fit, Muhammad Ali said that um, when you're in the gym and you get to the point that you're totally wiped out and you've got no more to give, that's when your training starts. Because when you get to that point, um, the people that carry on with that tenacity, they're the people that win. Um, so you genuinely do only get out what you put in. I feel like there's a, there's a, you know, I probably sound like, uh, well, I certainly sound like my dad and probably his dad before him. Um, but I feel like with young people, there's, like I said before, there, there is that lack in some ways of tenacity. And there is that thing where I want it and I want it now. 
um, you know, and, and that's very hard to escape from because certainly in, a, in an environment like ours, in a, in a society like ours, where you, you know, you switch your phone on and you order some food, and if it's not there in half an hour, you're annoyed. You don't even have to go to the gas station anymore to fill your car up. You get, you know, the cafe guy comes and does it for you. So you just use the app on the phone. Um, everything's instant grat gratification. Everything's I want it and I want it now. Um, you know, and a lot of people talk about that and, and, and um, you know, you get these, uh, you know, people that are maybe famous for nothing other than being famous um, and, and being notorious. And again, you know, the, the Instagram type uh, thing where they're all wearing Rolex watches at 19 years old and everybody thinks that's the way it should be. Um, and it's, it's really not like that. Um, okay, when should you consider a change? That's always a question that I get asked. So, okay, you've got in this job, you've been very pragmatic, you've been sensible, you understand you're not gonna be a CEO tomorrow and you've taken a pragmatic step into, into the kind of first stages of your career. When is it time to, to, to get into a, you know, the next step? Well, I think one good thing is when, when you're not happy anymore, when you don't feel like you're challenged anymore, um, I worked for one company um, and there was one guy that every morning I used to go into work and he would be there a few minutes before me, but he was the most miserable person I've ever met and he worked there for 30 years and I've never seen him happy and the people that I know that had worked there much longer than me, they would never seen him happy and I thought, and I asked him one day, so I went in and I said, why, why are you so unhappy at work? He said, I hate this job, it's only a means to an end, I'm looking forward to retirement. I said, but you've been here 30 years. And he said, yeah, and I've hated every moment of it. And I thought, wow, what a way to, to spend your time. Um, you know, you, you, as far as I'm aware, you only get one life um, and you shouldn't spend it miserable and happy and unhappy. So, you, you know, you owe yourself more self-respect to, um, to spend that time being unhappy. So certainly if, if you're not happy, certainly if you're not being challenged. Um, and, and my next slide um, is, is for me, this is, um, I can't honestly say that I've ever been unhappy in a job, you know, like genuinely unhappy. Um, you know, as I said, some days are better than others. But for me, when I, when I think it's right for a move, it's when every day kind of seems like it's the same. So a little cartoon there, you know, one hand saying what day is it and the other hand saying what difference does it make? And I think when you get to that point, you're ready for your next challenge. So be pragmatic, take those jobs, take those opportunities. You never know where it's going to lead, but don't sit still in them. You know, don't sit still and wait because in 30 years time, you don't want to be the guy complaining or, you know, or the lady complaining that, that you're miserable and, and you wish you'd taken opportunities. Um, now, that doesn't necessarily mean that you can become arrogant about it. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an engineer at heart. That's how I started my career. Um, if I went back to being an engineering manager, I would find it equally as difficult because it's a hard job. You know, if I was, we, we, we have um, facilities managers and senior facilities managers, assistant facilities managers, and I've, and I've been all those roles. If I went back to being an assistant facilities manager, I would find it difficult because it's a hard job. I'm not arrogant enough to think that I would go back and just find it easy and only put 50% of my attention to it and, and think that would get me through. But what would happen is it would be very familiar and very samey. So, you know, after, after I kind of got my feet uh, under the table and, and kind of got used to being in that role again, probably after a fairly short period of time, I would feel like I've been there before. And I think, well, man, where's this going? Every day is going to be equally as difficult, but it's just the same. It doesn't, it doesn't kind of raise anywhere from that. Um, like I said, some days are better than others, but it, it doesn't necessarily change. So at that point, I think if you're, if you're going to work every day and you're thinking, well, you know, this is challenging, it's tough getting through the day, but it doesn't feel like it's changing very much, then you're ready for your next move. And as I said, you should then think about that, think about what your next move looks like and what kind of things you can do to put yourself in that opportunity. So um, I, I uh, you know, I've, I've, I've met all kinds of people over the years and I, and I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't spoke to, to somebody at work and they, they, they were very frustrated that they hadn't been promoted. And I said, okay, well, tell me what jobs you've applied for and then we'll look at why you didn't get them and we'll, we'll put a personal development plan in place. And he said, oh no, I didn't apply for any jobs, but I've been here eight years and I should have been promoted. So uh, I think he kind of missed the point. Um, personal development plans, um, I, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, not a, I, I'm not one for detail, but a tremendous amount of detail. I tend to move quite quickly. Um, so I had to force myself to sit down and do my own personal development plan some, some years ago when I became a child. 
um, a, a chart engineer and a chart manager because you have to do that to, as part of the process. And I had to force myself to sit down and think, okay, well, let's look at some milestones. Let's look at kind of where I want to go and then really kind of map it out on paper. And I, I tend not to do that so much. I tend to kind of, um, you know, I like to, I like to probably in, in my mind move a little bit quicker than that. And, and I'm not, I'm not a big, um, not a big overthinker in the in the detail, and, but but I had to force myself to do it, and it is a good exercise. So, you know, sit down and and, and plan your future. I plan the next five years. Everybody should have a five year plan. Where do you want to be in five years? You know, where do you want to be in three years, one year? Um, look at that and think. Well, what can I do to achieve my goals in one year? What can I maybe do to set myself up to achieve my five year goals? Um, you know, and and, and either. Um, maybe however loosely you do that, you should still do it because, um, you know, otherwise you, you're probably not going to achieve, achieve your goals. Okay, so here we are, some life lessons. You know, you've been listening to me for around half an hour and I'm going to try and finish up now in uh, the next five or ten minutes and then you can ask uh, some questions. The world doesn't owe you anything. That's a really tough lesson. So right now, um, the world doesn't owe any of us anything. Um, it's... I don't know if you're interested in um, in physics or anything like that. I'm, I'm uh, very kind of uh, loosely interested in uh, cosmology and things like that. I was listening to Brian Cox's podcast when I was driving this morning, um, and he talks about the the size of the universe and you know the the, the kind of oh, I can't remember what it was now. I think it was something like eight trillion stars just in our solar sorry in our galaxy. Uh, and, 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 you know, the, 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 um, the, the, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get across is the size of that is you're genuinely insignificant in the cosmos. You, you know, it, it doesn't owe us anything. There's nothing sat there waiting for you. You're not going to wake up tomorrow and, and your future's sitting on a shelf ready for you to just pick up. It doesn't work that way. So the world doesn't owe you anything at all. I think if you go into life with that belief um, that the world doesn't owe you anything, you're never going to win the lottery. Um, and luck maybe won't, won't favour you and everything you get is going to be your own good fortune that you've created. I think that's a pretty healthy way to go into things. You don't have to be very miserable about it, you know, I just, I just don't believe that, um, you know, I deserve anything that I haven't worked for, I think is, is, is what I'm saying. Uh, you may have things mapped out, but life is going to change. So learn to adapt. The, the army has a great saying about adapting and overcoming. Um, and, you know, you're only, uh, your plans are only as good as your first contact. Or like Mike Tyson said, everybody's got a plan until they get a smack in the mouth. And then that plan tends to change. So life will change. You can map out that five-year plan, but who knows? You know, if we were probably doing this... Uh, you know, 18 months ago, I wouldn't have mentioned COVID. Who, who knew that that was coming, you know, or, or who knew for sure that was coming and how it would affect our lives? Um, it, I think if I'd have probably done a lecture 18 months ago and told you exactly what would happen, um, you would have all laughed and switched off because it was so unbelievable. So you, you really can't, you really can't see into the future. You can give yourself the best chance, but you have to be adaptable. You know, so tomorrow, um, you know, I hope that things don't, don't take a bad turn, but if they do, I'll still get up, I'll still try my best, I'll still keep moving forward, and I think I'll be all right in the end. It might take me a few years again to get back on my feet, but I'll be all right in the end. Um, so, so just be adaptable. Uh, life is tough. Um, if you want an inspirational speech, go on to the Rocky speech when he talks to his, uh, his son in the street. Um, you probably guess that I spend a lot of time on YouTube and, and, and things like that. But Rocky does a, a speech, Sylvester Stallone does a speech to his son and he says, look, you know, nobody can punch as hard as life. Um, but it's not about um, it's not about how hard you can punch, it's how much you can take and get up and still keep moving. So strength comes from tenacity. Um, and if you want real inspiration, you know, go, go and talk to somebody that's raised children in very difficult uh, circumstances and been a success and their children have gone on to be successes. That's tenacity. Um, tenacity isn't going on Instagram and showing off with your new Rolex or winning the lottery because that, that doesn't, that doesn't uh, breed tenacity. Um, tenacity is getting up every morning. You know, these guys that, that um, have, have families and they go to work every day and they don't stop and they don't quit and they still push forward to provide for their families, that's tenacity. You know, but it's tough and some days you'll get up and you don't want to play anymore, but that's, uh, you know, that, that's when it really counts. Like Muhammad Ali said, when you've got nothing left but you keep going, that's, that's when you're really working. 
Uh, and when you go through challenges, you learn. Challenges are there to be overcome. Now, don't seek them out. You know, don't, don't put yourself through misery and pain just for the sake of putting yourself through misery and pain. Um, I was in the army for a little while. I never understood practicing being cold and wet on hillsides because you might have to do it one day. That never, that never kind of made any sense to me. So, you know, don't, don't practice being miserable. Um, but you will learn when, uh, when challenges come your way. Well, hopefully you will. And, and, and this kind of goes into feedback as well. So be open to feedback. Feedback sometimes very, very hard to take. If somebody tells you that you're not good at something that you thought you were, or they give you some very challenging feedback. But, but if you can go away with that, you know, if you can maybe not instantly respond and take that away and think about it and be honest with yourself, that's where you learn. So, you know, the challenges in life, um, you know, they're there to be overcome and you will learn from them. Think of the bigger picture. This is a, this is a thing, this is a military thing. So in my regiment, if you, if you had to be somewhere, then you had to be there seven minutes before. And if you weren't there seven minutes before, you were late, which sounds nuts, but that's the, you know, that was, that was the way they did things. And, the, and it wasn't just about being on time. The message was that maybe other people are relying on you and they will suffer if you're not there on time. But equally, you might miss your opportunity. So if you're supposed to be somewhere at a certain time, get there, be there on time, because you might miss that opportunity. It might be that one meeting. And if you think back, you know, if you think about all the, if you think about uh, an algorithm or a, you know, an equation, you think about all the things in your life that had to happen just so you're listening to me right now, it's almost impossible to come up with that algorithm. There are a lot of things in, in play that, you know, maybe maybe you were going to go and do something and, and it didn't happen, so you decided to tune in here instead. Maybe you were going to go to a different university and you decided to go to this, all those things. Um, if you hadn't taken those decisions, you wouldn't be sat here listening to me and, and, uh, and I hope it's, it's worthwhile that you are. But just, if you're going to be somewhere, be there on time, be there prepared and make sure you're ready because other people might be relying on you. I, I tend to take quite a dim view of people being late. I normally give you 10 minutes and then you've missed your slot. So if you turn up to an interview and you, you know, you're, you're late without a very, very good reason, then I'm going to consider that you didn't really want it badly enough that you, you, know, you couldn't be bothered to make it on time. Um, that also seems to be a big problem, but plan ahead, be ready to go. I'm very often, I signed into this uh, webinar about 20 minutes early. Um, just because I'd rather be 20 minutes early than 20 seconds late. So, you know, and, and like I said, I'm not looking for sympathy, but I've got a cold. So, um, you know, I could have I could have made a phone call and said, hey, look, I feel terrible. You know, my wife said to me just uh, 10 minutes ago or 10 minutes before this, she said, you look terrible, all your eyes are red. And I said, yeah, but you know, I'm doing a lecture. I can't, I can't phone in sick. Um, there are people relying on me. They've probably taken time out of their day to, to listen in. So be on time. That's a big, big thing for me. Um, but also remember, you're not just a cog in a machine. You've got something to offer, you know. So I talked about pragmatism. I talked about not chasing your dream like it's just some pure singularity, some single photon out there that you're after without any, you know, without looking at anything out the side. Um, and, and, and I try to counter that by offering pragmatism. But that doesn't mean you've got to swing the other way. So you're not just a cog in a machine. You've got something to offer. Never, ever be afraid to be the one asking the silly questions because that might make the difference in failure and success. And I can give you a real life example. When I was about 10 years old, um, we were doing um, uh, mathematics and it was subtraction. And the teacher wasn't particularly good, if I'm honest. And, and she was writing on the board and she wrote two numbers, like, you know, 150 and underneath she wrote, you know, 100. And the way she was explaining it, I thought you took the top number from the bottom number and I kept getting them wrong. I kept getting them and she kept telling me off and shouting at me and telling me that I was stupid and all kind of things you're not supposed to do these days to kids. And, and I didn't know and, and I was too scared to ask. And I got every single one, you know, I was even saying there were minus numbers until this guy called Philip and I remember his name, Philip said, Miss, do you take the bottom number from the top or the other way around? And she shouted at him and she actually whacked him on the head with a ruler and said, stupid boy, you always take the bottom number from the top number in a, in a you know, simple math, something like that. And from that point on, I got every single one right. And before that, I, you know, I got every single one wrong. So I, I thought it was a really silly question and somebody else took the whack on the head for me. So now if you're in a meeting with me, you might see me ask a silly question. Sometimes I even do it because I think that other people might want to ask that question, but they feel silly. So sometimes I'll ask the question. Um, I don't think you can go wrong with that. You know what? And if you ask a question, if you ask it twice, if it's a silly question twice or three times, then maybe. But if you ask a question once because you don't know the answer, it's not a silly question. So ask the question. 
Um, and, and I think, again, that's definitely uh, been a big thing for me between success and failure. Um, you know, I, I did it recently on a, on a, on a call, on a, uh, you know, a, a team's call. Um, I asked a question and about five other people said, oh, I'm so glad you asked that question because I was wondering as well. So don't be afraid of, of asking questions. Um, and this is my favorite saying, it is what it is. Sometimes you just can't change things. So accept it and move on. Don't stand there arguing when you're not going to get anywhere. Have the, have the intelligence to see that it's not, you know, it, it just is what it is. You can't do anything about it. There's no point in arguing. There's no point in crying about it. Just move on. Now, I know that's tough. I know that's a lot easier to say than actually do, you know, when something bad happens and you want the world to know how miserable or how angry you are or how frustrated you are, or you want to tell the person that's upset, you want them to feel the same that you do. Um, again, funny story. I, I love telling stories. I used to play football, uh, soccer, you know, English football when I was younger. Um, and one guy uh, fouled somebody else and he fell over and he hurt himself. We were playing on AstroTurf, that false grass, and he grazed all his leg and he was bleeding. And he got up and he was going to thump the other guy and the referee tried to stop him. And he said, look, no way. I'm going to spend the rest of my evening in pain and he's not going away scot-free. And the ref stood aside and let him punch him. And, you know, I thought, okay, fair enough, but don't do that. You know, accept it and move on. There's no point in getting yourself into a situation that you can't change. All you're going to do is frustrate yourself, annoy them, and maybe create a scenario that you can't work away from. So, you know, quite often you'll, you know, I'll push and I'll push and I'll push, and then I'll get to a point where I realize you can't go any further, and I'll say, it is what it is. I say that a lot, and I've been saying it for years, but genuinely, it is what it is. So move on. Don't waste your time. Final slide, I'm sure you're pleased to hear that. Uh, ultimately, as with anything that's hard to come by, and this is what Denzel says in his speech as well, we do agree on at least one thing. Uh, it just comes down to how badly do you want it? How, you know, how, how much work are you going to put in? And like I said, what's very, very important is don't do it dishonestly. You know, you, you, you know what's honest and what's dishonest. Don't stab anybody in the back. Have some integrity, work hard. If you don't get there, you might get there tomorrow. But how badly do you want it? What kind of sacrifices are you willing to take? Thank you. Um, are there any questions? <clears throat> Hi, thank you, Stuart, uh, for that wonderful, insightful uh, session. Uh, definitely a lot, a lot to take away from. Uh, and we have some very interesting questions. Would you like me to read them out to you? Oh, I, can, I can see them, uh, the, the ones that have been typed. So let me just try and answer quickly. Um, okay. Uh, what do you think has the biggest impact on somebody's career success and finding something they're passionate about, attitude or academia and qualifications? Okay, I've got a personal view on this. Other people will differ. And just remember what I said. I'm just one guy with one opinion and one journey. My view is attitude. Um, is 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 comes comes above paper qualifications. Let, let, let's be honest here. Paper qualifications, if you put the right effort in, they're not terribly difficult to get. Now I, I know you have to work hard for them. You know I've got a degree, a master's degree. I, you know I, I know how hard it was, but they're obtainable. You can get them. It's just it, it's how much you're willing to put the effort in, and, and how many nights you're willing to spend. You know writing dissertations when your friends are out um, in the pub or whatever. Um, for, for me, the right attitude is everything. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, the reason I got a master's degree, other than the fact that I like to learn, was because I knew that people expected it at the level that I was working at. So, it, you know, it's partly that. I, I also enjoyed doing it, if I'm honest, and, you know, it, it, I enjoyed learning. Um, but for me, I, I think attitude is everything. I can, I can teach you everything else, but if you don't come with the right attitude, then we're, we're not going to go anywhere. Um, uh, purpose of life is important, or the process through which you fulfil the purpose is important. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure on the question, um, but I, I guess you know, like the, the, the purpose of, of life is, is, I guess, the same as your passion. You know, it's like I said, what do you want? What 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 do you see as as your thing? Uh, now, whether that's to become the, the you know a great musician and, and share your art through music or you know, whether you want to be a CEO or whether you just want freedom, which is what I wanted. I never set out to be a CEO. That wasn't in my plan. Um, I just wanted the freedom to make my own choices. And in order to do that, I had to get a good career. 
um, because you know a lot of things are financially driven. Let's be honest about it. Um, and so I, I think the you know choose cho choose choose your targets. I guess choose your future. Choose your, you know set your goals and, and then put the passion in because that's how you're going to get there. Um, you know, I think you need both of them. If I'm reading the question right, I think, you know, you need to, you need to look for your purpose, look for where you want to go and then put the passion in. Is it ever too late to change career paths? And no, absolutely not. Um, I read a book, I can't remember which by now, but it was a guy who was in the British SAS. And um, when he finished with that, when he was about 40 something years old, he went and became a barrister. Uh, which is a pretty, pretty, and, and he had no qualifications. So he went and did a law degree and then he went and did um, his uh, articles and then, he, and then he went and trained with, with a barrister in London and, and he's now a successful barrister. Um, I can't remember the name of the book, um, uh, but I'm sure you could Google it. Um, it's not, not that hard to find, but definitely not. Um, you've got to be pragmatic. You know, if you want to be a, a 50 year old gymnast and win the Olympics, then that might be a challenge for you. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. Um, I used to, like I said, I used to race motocross um, and there was a guy who was in his 60s and um, he never won a race. In fact, most of the time he came last, but you know what, he had such fun doing it. Um, so I, I guess, I guess you've, got to be, you've got to be pragmatic and, and sometimes you've got to think about your family as well. So, um, you know, it'd be great if we could all just abandon uh, things and be reckless and just go after our, our dreams and not consider anybody else. Um, but, but I think sometimes you do have to take a, a pragmatic, a pragmatic view on that. Um, I did notice a question. It said something like, where are we? The dismissed questions. I, I don't shy away from difficult questions. Um, uh, where, I'm working in your organization since 2010, same position, same basic salary. I didn't get any promotion or increments. Should I continue as it is? You've got the answer, you know? If I'd been in an organization for 10 years um, and I hadn't got anywhere, I'd start to ask some serious questions of myself. So I promise you those opportunities are there. I use as an example, he's not on the call or anything, but Gopal, who's our operations director, he started at Emerald 17 years ago in quite a junior position. Um, he's now the operations director. He's now one of the four top people in the business after 17 years. Um, and he didn't get there by an accident. He, he worked very, very hard. Um, you know, I, 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 and, and something like 20% of all the people in Emerald started, at least 20%, um, started as something else, started as something else. I, I didn't join as CEO. I joined as something else and I became CEO. Um, you know, all the ELTs joined as something else. The executive leadership team joined as something else and were promoted into those roles. Um, all the general managers started as something else and were promoted to general managers. Um, you know, I, I've personally promoted engineers, I've promoted technicians. Um, so Luke, that, that's, I, I think that's a fair question, but you should be asking that question to yourself, not me, because I'm not going to come and find you and put a promotion on a plate. If you want it, go after it, talk to your line managers, you know, drop somebody an email, get yourself in front of people. Um, you know, there, there was, um, there's a lot of very inspirational people in Emerald. Uh, I used to run a boxing class at the camp. One guy came to my boxing class and that was how he approached me and he got a promotion after demonstrating his tenacity and how he was willing to work harder than everybody else. Uh, where, where's, uh... Is minimum wage system that practice in Europe and America, is that acceptable to adopt in Emerald? What's your option? Uh, or maybe that means what is your opinion? Um, look, wages are what they are. They're market driven. They're not driven by companies. Um, you know, companies very rarely decide on the wage that they're going to pay um, their employees. It's, it's market driven. So if you're, you know, if you're an electrician, which is, you know, I'm an electrical engineer, there's a certain amount of money that an electrical engineer can demand in this type of a market, wherever you are in the world. If I was in Jakarta, it might be different than if I was in New York. Um, but there's a certain amount that you can demand. That's not really um, dictated by the company. That's dictated by what a client will pay for those roles. So if, you know, if, if, if a client approaches us and says, look, we want 10 electrical engineers, 
we'll put together a spec and a, and a you know a, a solution and we'll give them a commercial price for that i don't get to really within reason i don't get to decide what that commercial price is the market does because if i give too high a price and give people too high wages they'll go to somebody else so in a perfect world i'd want to pay everybody a, you know a high amount of money I'm, you know i'm a, I'm a nice guy i, I don't want to you know, I don't, I don't want to uh, put anybody under any uh, hardship financially, but we're limited by what the market will take. And certainly in a market like today, where it's very challenging, it's very price driven. Um, if I give everybody in the business a pay rise and then go to my clients and say, hey, look, you've got to pay us more um, because I've just given everybody a pay rise, then we're going to lose that contract. Um, and when we've lost contracts, Emerald's a very, very good company. We don't lose it because of our performance, because we, we don't do a good job. We lose it because of our pricing. And so that's a challenge in the market. So um, I think that's a very wide question about, about minimum wages, but you know, I don't think that companies decide that. I think, I think markets and societies and things, you know, like I said, I use Jakar as an example. Um, you know, I could use, I could use Dakar or I could use, um, you know, Aarhus in Denmark, um, salaries are different in those places and it all depends what the market will stand. Um, Stuart, there's a question on the chat box um, as well. I can't see that one. Um, where, where is that? If you click on the chat icon. Or so. I don't have a chat icon. I just have the, um, oh, hang on, the chat. Okay. Uh, to, to, about taking a career break. Okay, it's a tough decision and seems to be not well received when trying to find a role. Your thoughts? Absolutely. Again, pragmatism. I can only give you honest answers. You know, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. Um, I sometimes get in trouble for being too honest. What you've got to consider about when you take a career break is what's going to. Happen? Let's say you take a career break for a year and the company gets by without you. What's going to happen then when you say, "Hey, I want to come back"? No, no. You know, in a perfect world. And, and I'll always try and support that always, but you've just got to be pragmatic. You know, I, I would think, well, okay, I'm the CEO of Emerald, and if I were, if I approached the board and said, hey guys, listen, I want to take a year out. In a year's time, when I, when I go back and say, hey, I'm ready to come back now, they're, they're, they're human beings. They're going to consider, well, hang on, we, we've managed without this guy for a year. And, you know, hopefully the, the, the business is still going very well. I mean, if it isn't, then it speaks for itself. Um, career breaks are a challenge. I think certainly they're, they're much easier when you're younger. So, you know, I, I, I took a gap year. I went, I went um, traveling around the world. Um, that, that's a pretty acceptable thing to do now. If you're a 40 year old, um, I don't know, whatever manager, and you decide to take a trip, there's a few things to consider. So you're, you know, the, the world moves very quick now, especially if you're in a technical or an IT type trade or, or whatever it is. So when you come back, you've probably missed out on a whole lot of technology. Um, the company's probably moved on. You've moved on. Um, I, I've never taken, you know, since you know, since I was, you know, in my in my twenties or whatever, you know, it, um, and I took, started taking my career seriously. I haven't taken a career break. I'd be a little bit cautious. I'd love to support it. I genuinely would. Um, and if we can do, we certainly would. Um, you just got to be a little bit honest about it and think, well, hey, you know. If I kind of step back for a year, where am I going to be and where's the company going to be and where's the industry going to be and where's everything going to be in a year when, while I stood still? Um, so I hope that answers that question. As I said, it's maybe not the answer that you wanted to hear. I don't know. Uh, but, but I hope it was an honest answer. Uh, any, other, any other questions? Uh, there was a question that came in um which was in Arabic. So I just asked Rana if you could type the question in English for us. And the steward, can you read Arabic? Oh, unfortunately, I can't. Oh, I can swear, swear. I can, I can speak a very good <laughs> part of Arabic. Um, I should try much harder with that, but um, not to blame anybody, but everybody speaks English so well that um, I've never been forced to. Other than when I was working with engineers um, that, that only spoke Arabic. So um, you know, I know what a screwdriver is, I know how to tell somebody to open something and things like that, or ask somebody, um, but it was necessity that forced me to do it. So where, where's the, can I see where it's been typed? It's in the answered uh, section. Ah, okay. Uh, no. 
Ah, okay. How can I join your recruiting company and feel that we'll learn more if and gain knowledge? Okay. Well, I, I guess, you know, like every, everybody uh, finds inventive ways um, to, to do things. I, I think the most, the most obvious way is to look for an opportunity in the business because we advertise all our opportunities. Um, and, uh, and then apply for it and make sure you tailor your CV, so your resume, make sure that you, you know, like if, if it's an engineering job, don't put that you're great at HR, you know, that might be a skill that you've got or, or that you're great at sales if you want to be an electrical engineer. You'd be very surprised at the amount of resumes that I get that are just generic resumes that are written for any kind of job and people send them out to 50 jobs that are not even related. And so I'll read something and it's got lots of things in there that have got nothing to do with the job that, that I'm, I'm, you know, I'm reading the resume for. So tailor your CV, um, you know, look for, um, hopefully we're going to be doing more internships, uh, more work experience things. Um, again, you've got a great opportunity as an Arabic speaker. Um, I'm very keen on, um, on employing, you know, we're in the Middle East, so I'm very keen on employing Arabic people. Um, for diversity and uh, you know for, for future sustainability of, of the business of the region so you know find a way um, I could give you I could I could tell you how, how I do it or I'll, I'll tell you one person that joined Emerald um, applied for the job and then did a whole load of networking um, and eventually got to speak to somebody who gave him some really good advice about the interview process and he got the job and I didn't know this until afterwards and I said you know you did a great interview and he told me well that's because you know I did my research I did some networking um, you know I approached people it was hard but eventually you know I got talked to somebody who told me a lot about the business nothing untoward nothing unfair but just told me a lot about how Emerald works, what kind of a culture it is, how I might fit into that. It gave him really good, honest advice. Um, and he did great in an interview. And obviously that wasn't an accident. That was that stuff that I'm talking about, creating your own fortune and, and making sure that you're in the right place with the right opportunity. Um, but look on LinkedIn, um, look on our company website, um, look on the social media, Facebook as well. We advertise jobs. Um, you know, and, and approaches, um, if you can, it, it's a little bit hard now because I used to do a lot of face-to-face -face, uh, lecturing and speaking on panels and things and people used to come up to me afterwards and have a chat and I'd give them my card and that was, that was a little bit easier. It's more difficult now because we're distanced, um, you know, using these kind of platforms, but there are ways you can do it. Um, so, so maybe do some reading and, and, and find inventive ways to get yourself in front of the right person. I think we have run out of uh, time for more questions, unfortunately. Um, well, thank you very much. I hope, I've, um, I hope, I've, I hope it's been interesting. Um, as I said, I, I, I didn't want to do a very grand inspirational speech. I wanted to give what I thought was, was pragmatic tips and a, a bit of honesty. The sort of conversations that I have or I had with my children. I've got two daughters that have grown up, they're both working, my son's 17, he's just starting out. These are the kind of you know honest tips that I give to him. So I hope you've have learned something uh, from it. Um, and I hope that it wasn't uh, too arduous. Thank you so much, uh, Stuart, for joining us at Mondays at Murdoch and for the wonderful session. I will share the feedback of the audience with you later as well and um thank you everyone for joining us thank you thanks bye